Testing, 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 testing. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this, the 2nd of April. Wait, is it the 2nd? Yes, it's the 2nd of April, the day after April Fool's Day. Hooray. My brother called me yesterday and told me that they'd found a cure for coronavirus and that it was immediately distributable and that the quarantine was being lifted. And I believed him. And then he... He hooted like a gibbon that I had, uh, that I had. Oh, I've got some questions. First of all, where's the bow tie? Is this shirt not sufficiently interesting for you? Okay, I'll go get a bow tie. Since it's, since it's, okay, if, if you're going to be like that, fine. I'll go get a bow tie. I'll be right back. So, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, two questions. First, just out of curiosity, one, have there been any people in the class who were hit with an academic dishonesty charge? Two, I've sent you an email regarding the MSF, and I'm wondering if when we would know about the relief that would come from that MSF. Um, yeah, I probably just haven't gotten to it yet, uh, to be honest with you. I've been receiving quite a few MSFs over the last, this last test, but, uh, you know, don't worry, MSAFs will be processed in due time. This is way too long, I need to shorten it. Um, yes, I, I, I probably haven't just, haven't gotten to the MSAF yet, and have people been charged with academic dishonesty yet in this course? Uh, why, uh, without, without revealing too much, I guess, yes, there have been quite a few people who have received well i'm not sure about okay we have to make a distinction there are a large number of people well large there are a small number of people relative to the size of the class but a large number of people relative to zero people who have received zeros on assignments because it has been found that they cheated on them this is not the same thing as engaging in formal charges of academic dishonesty with the university administration. Those are different things, right? Um, generally speaking, the whole, like, the academic dishonesty charges, like, if you want to charge someone formally, you need to be able to do it with a very, very high standard of evidence and the person that you're being accused is allowed legal counsel, and it's just like this whole terrible situation that nobody would want to deal with, anybody in their right mind. So generally speaking, uh, and generally speaking, giving them a zero and saying don't do this again is sufficient for them to not do it again. So we usually handle it at that level. But uh, to your question, yes, there have been people who have gotten zeros because of academic dishonesty in this course, uh, there's usually at least, uh, you know, four or six people per assignment that get hit with it. Um, however, uh, it, and uh, it, it looks like there will be a few more people who get hit with it with respect to the test. Um, I did say uh, several times that, uh, you know, we are not, you are not to share your answers, but apparently some people did, so those people will be uh, receiving emails in the in the coming days. But yeah, so anyway, that's, that's everything with respect to academic dishonesty. 
Um, when will we get the midterm marks back? Well, it's uh, not quite yet. The uh, there are there were a few people who had accommodations um, with respect to extensions of the time limit for the test. So these people have not. Uh, I think one or two. One of them is a rather long, um, quite quite a long extension. Um, and that person, I believe, uh, well, anyway, in a few days, yes, Piazza, uh, Piazza was a mess over the testing period, um, like, with respect to what? Um, could you be more specific about what, how Piazza was a mess? Because if it was a mess, then maybe I could do something about it for, for the exam, um, but um, so midterm mar grade, midterm grades should be coming back. Uh, maybe tomorrow. If not tomorrow, then by Monday for certain. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess people just thought it was an assignment and not a test. Uh, it's it's not it wasn't an assignment it was a test and I actually had given Josh specific order like orders I had given him orders no I had asked him to you know ensure that people aren't sharing their answers on Piazza because you know you're not supposed to be sharing your answers um, it's a test not an assignment but uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I, I guess there's, I, I, I suppose there's nothing really we can do about that, eh? Oof. Um, anyway, I can, I can give you guys some impression of what the grades look like. I, I, we do have some preliminary results. We're really just, you know, waiting for everybody's results to come in uh, before we, before we make anything public, but I can show you the histogram. Um, come on, it's on my phone here. Give me a moment, please. Yeah. So, uh, let me just check OBS to see if I, this looks visible. Mm, not super visible. Let me see if I can, maybe turning the brightness down. That helps, yes. So this is a histogram of the marks from the test. Please note that this is, uh, although it says the top is 60 here, this is out of the total number of marks on the test. Not uh, the, these aren't percentage points. So there were some people who got, um, you know, well, I haven't actually seen the breakdown in terms of percentages yet, but there were people who did well on the test. Let's put it that way. Um, so the class average on that test was round about 72%, which personally I feel is a good average. That means that the average is sort of in B minus territory, which is what an average should be. The average should be around a B. So I was pretty pleased. Well, I was happy to see that. Um, I feel it was mainly the wording of some of the questions were kind of confusing. Yes. So, yes. The, when you say com confusing, perhaps you meant ambiguous. So, up to this point in the course, pretty much every question that you have had has had like no room for functionality outside of what the question asked. However, with respect to some of the elements in the uh, the virus game class question in particular, there was a certain amount of uh, ambiguity, I guess you could say, that was built, baked into the question itself. It was like, satisfy this condition, but aside from that, just, you know, make sure that these other conditions are met. Uh, there was a certain amount of leeway in the way that you could accomplish the goal. This was not unintentional. So, 
you know, as long as as long as you're following what the question asked, then you'll get the marks for the question. So, my goodness, there we go. Is it possible if you spread out marks for the exam? Uh, I mean, 23 marks for question one is just way too much. Oh, um, well, to be fair, it was a rather large question. The It was sort of implicitly divided into subparts where each of the methods was a subpart of the question that was marked differently. But yeah, it, like that question was excuse me, quite substantial, and that was the reason it was worth, worth so many marks. There was a lot of, it was the longest question. So, yeah, I don't, I think that the, like, the, the exam is testing a lot more different subjects, and I can confirm for you right now that the exam has more than four questions on it. So, yeah, or five questions, including the bonus. So, yes, the exam will be a little more spread out, if that makes sense. Not, uh, we'll, we'll see. I don't know. Maybe it's a little easier, but then again, I haven't finished writing it yet. So, yeah. If there are any other questions about the test or the upcoming exam or anything like that, please feel free to air your concerns now. And while you do, I realize that this might not be the best time to hit you guys up for this, but... So, my understanding is that course evaluations are now open. Well, they might have been. If they're following the old schedule, they might actually have just shut down course evaluations for this semester. Let me just check. Master course evaluations. Boop-a-doop. Will each weekly topic be on the exam in some form? Implicitly or implicitly? Oh, all undergraduate electronic course evaluations for current academic sessions have been suspended. Drat! Ah, I always, I always love reading the course evals. It's like, it's really, like, I, I know, like, I, I genuinely enjoy reading everybody's comments about the course. So... Not to mention, like I've been, I've been using the statistics in the course to, you know, will work up like a, a dossier so that I might be able to get a full-time position somewhere. But like, ah, yeah, okay. So there are no course evals this semester. What a shame. If you, uh, if you want to, I guess you can just like email me a number out of ten. <laughs> anyway, uh, don't actually, but uh, you can if you want. Um, so, will each weekly topic be on the exam in some form? Yes, explicitly or implicitly. Some of the earlier stuff, like loops and if statements, for example, that's obviously going to be tested in just about every question. Data structures are kind of in a similar boat to that. They're going to be tested implicitly because other things require them. However, you can expect a classes question, you can expect a file I.O. question, you can expect an exceptions question. Um, you can expect a question about SQL queries. Um, you can expect a, uh, a question, uh, what's the other one? Something, something about, um, um, what is it? The thing with the numbers. Numerical computation. The unit on numerical computation, there'll be some callbacks to that. Um, yeah, there, yeah, so the exam is intended to cover the course sort of in its entirety in a, uh, in a cumulative fashion. So, yes. Uh, will it cover the, all the material or will it cover one specific part of the course more than others? I hope that it... Uh, it'll be, well, some things are going to necessarily have more weight than others. Um, you can expect classes to figure reasonably, reasonably prominently just because those questions tend to be large. Um, 
you know, it, there's, I'll, I'll try to make sure that it's reasonably evenly spaced, but there are going to be clusters, and I'm not sure where those clusters are going to land yet, because again, I haven't, I haven't completed writing the test yet. Let's see. Um, we can make a Google Doc or forms specifically for the course. That's true, we could. Um, maybe I'll get the, well, I don't know. The, the problem, the problem that we, that uh, I have, like the, the, the evaluation system that exists for the course, courses at the university is a good one because it's completely anonymous, right? So if I were to try to replicate the evaluation system, I would not be able to guarantee you the same degree of anonymity. That would color the results, so the results wouldn't be acceptable from the standpoint of somebody looking at them to determine anything. But uh, yeah, I've done course, course evals via Avenue for some other courses. You could probably do something like that. I'll probably just not bother, to be honest with you. Will there any be, be any multiple choice or short answer type questions? There will be no multiple choice questions, but there will be some short answer type questions. Um, however, I consider formulating an SQL query to be a short answer question because it's like one line of code. So there you go. There's some information about the exam for you. Are we able to get the solution for the test after the mark comes out? Yes. Uh, uh, we'll be distributing that uh, once the marks have come out. Also, if we're going to be tested on SQL queries, may, can you maybe give us some practice problems since that topic wasn't on any assignment? Um, that, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that one. My initial reaction is to that is... The um, the website that I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> Oof, pardon me. The website that we were doing in in tutorial is uh, is what I would recommend for practice problems for SQL in the same way that um, in the same way that Coding Bat was a good resource for. Uh, Python problems at the beginning of the beginning of the course. Also, if you were to Google SQL questions, then you would find a large volume of them just with a simple Google search. So yeah. Uh, however, I will I will find some problem sets and and put them up in some manner. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> yes. So, with respect to that, I think that's everything that we can, everything that we can do for now. I suppose I could do a course evaluation as like an unmarked quiz on Avenue. Well, anyway. So, if there are no more questions... Oh, here's another question. Where will we be able to find the solution avenue? No, we would email them to you in the same way that we email the solution, like the feedback emails for the assignments. Because we have, because it's done through Jupyter, we have that mechanism available, so we'll use it. Okay? Cool. So, so let us talk about our final topic for this course. We'll probably, we probably will not get through the entirety of it as I would like to have our remaining lectures in next week focusing on exam review and you guys. So for the lecture next week, please bring some questions that you'd like me to answer live on live stream, and we will accomplish that. However, for the moment, let's talk machine learning. So machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. What is it? In order to talk about it, we have to know what we're talking about. Machine learning, generally speaking, is a term that we use for any type of software that gains experience. And I'm not talking about gaining experience in the way that a, an RP, in an RPG you level up and gain experience. What we mean by gaining experience is that as the program runs, 
it attempts to improve the results that it's giving back based on previous inputs. So <clears throat> you have a program and you are feeding into that program inputs over a period of time and it's giving you outputs over a period of time and as that time goes on the outputs that it's giving you are becoming better and better approximations of the output that you want because it's being exposed to more and more data. Kind of similar to the way that a, uh, a human being improves their knowledge by having experienced things, although humans do it at a much more abstract level. Machine learning is primarily a technique of statistical analysis. Obviously, with st statistical analysis, the larger the data set that you're working with, the more accurate the results you of your analysis will be. And this is the reason that more data points mean better machine learning. So you have a couple of different types of uh, systems. You have systems that are kind of just put in place and let run. And then you have the systems that are pre-trained. So if you expose a machine learning system to a large volume of data prior to its uh, prior to you considering the output to be any good, then you are training the machine. Um, and generally speaking, when it comes to training data, you already know what the expected output is for the data set when you put it in. That way, the computer can self-check against the expected output. So, linear regression, for example, is a is a type of machine learning. So, we have a few categories. Here's some important terminology for you. We have supervised learning and we have unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, the computer is given an example, uh, given some inputs and the desired output for each input. This is the, tra the um, training data model. The idea is that the computer does a lot of work in the background to try to determine what the relationship is between the input data and the output data in a way that can be repeated so that it increases the accuracy of its prediction of what the output should be based on the input. But this is sort of, this is good in situations where there is no clear mathematical methodology of arriving at the output from the input for many like for all of the for all of the programs that we have written so far we have had we have either had a mathematical model of the method by which we arrive at the output from the input or we have imagined that it's reasonable for a student to be able to come up with the mathematical method of arriving at the output from the input. This is often done by specifying the output in terms of the input. However, in machine learning, you don't necessarily know how a mathematic mathematical model should arrive at the output from the input. In the other instance, we have unsupervised learning. This is where the computer is given the just given input and it's told to identify some structure or pattern within the data, sort of irrespective of what humans think the out sh outputs should be. That's the thing about training data, is that when you have said to the computer, I expect this to be the output for this data, what you're essentially doing is you're placing on that data a bias. The bias might be important, but the bias, like, it's possible for a machine learning system to come up with a solution to a problem that is unbiased by human interpretation of the problem. This is where you would use unsupervised learning. So, yes. Uh, a good example of machine learning 
for all of these uh, capture, y y uh, you know CAPTCHA? CAPTCHA, the thing that, you know, prove you're not a robot thing. They show you a, lately it's been, they show you a matrix of images and they say something like, click all of the images that contain a stop sign or a stop light or a railroad track or a truck or something like that, right? You may not realize it, but what you are actually doing is you are contributing to a large database of, of training data for machine learning programs that are learning how to drive, right? So it's, it's reasonably easy in human terms to describe what a stop sign is, right? It's a red octagon with a white border that has the white capitalized letters stop in it. However, it's by no means it's by no means obvious for a machine to be able to look at a picture and say, "Oh, I see a stop sign in that picture." You and this has to do some uh somewhat with the manner in which uh, computers encode pictures, right? You're not looking at, like, we have this vision of an image as a continuous object uh, in human terms, but to a computer, what you're dealing with is a matrix of differently colored rectangles, right? So the mere idea of being able to recognize an octagon involves a non trivial amount of mathematics. Right. So recognizing a stop sign, which is a more complicated thing than a hexagon, is even more complicated. Right. <clears throat> so uh, at any rate, machine learning. That's so. That's kind of how you how you do machine. That's an application of it. Another important piece of terminology is classification. This is you. This is an application. Of machine learning, so I've said I think I've said this previously in the course, but one of the fundamental mechanisms of human thought is classification. If you look at an object, you can tell it's a chair, and a chair is a thing you can sit in. Therefore, you sit in the chair. We're trying to teach computers how to classify. So this is a type of supervised learning. So we have a training set. Uh, we normally have a large, uh, like a more than a couple, more than one label. And our goal is to f come up with a rule that classifies inputs uh, based on the data in the training data. So there are a couple of methodologies to classification, but we'll get there. We also have regression analysis. Uh, this is also a type of supervised learning. Rather than attempting to categorize things, which is the point of classification. In regression, you're trying to come up with a mathematical formula which models the data, right? As I'm sure all of you remember linear regression from high school. So the whole point of regression is that you can extrapolate that function to ranges outside the range where you have data. In this particular case, you would know what the data would likely look like, look like at, you know, values or x values, 100, 200, 5,000, etc. Another interesting application of machine learning is clustering analysis. So in clustering analysis, what we are attempting to do is we are trying to group things together based on similarity. So we have, uh, as we can see here, a group of data points essentially in a two dim in two dimensional space and we have a couple of obvious we have three obvious clusters with respect to our human imp uh, impressions of how to group objects however with respect to computers we can do this but it takes some math a an example of how a computer might cluster this these data right here is according to the colors now appearing on the screen. We have a yellow group, we have a blue group, and we have a red group. 
So, let's talk about classification. In supervised learning, we are given a data set of what are called feature vectors, each with some labeling. So, given a new vector, we can we can have a an implicit impression of how we might classify it. So, we have all of these people, Lincoln, Washington, Harris, etc. We have nationality, American or French. We have heights and we have labels. Notice that the labels seem to be more strongly correlated to height than to nationality. So if we were to predict whether Thomas Jefferson is should be labeled A or B, we would probably predict label A because his height is, well, he's actually got the exact same statistics as George Washington, and George Washington was labeled an A, so Thomas Jefferson was prob would probably have been labeled an A as well. In So clustering analysis, on the other hand, is a type of unsupervised learning. The feature vectors are given without any classification, and the computer is expected to come up with some sort of index of similarity. But the question is, how do we measure similarity? Well, there's some math to do. First, we need to construct a numerical vector to represent the features, and then we need to compute a distance between those vectors. So let's consider the following data set. We have a bunch of animals, a bunch of features of animals, and what we want to do is we want to decide the similarness or dissimilarness of the animals in these in, in this data set. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to come up with a numerical representation of all of the things that aren't numbers here. So if we, for example, which is, you know, fairly standard at this point, if we say that true is one and false is zero, and we can also say that yes is one and no is zero, that's yes and no and true and false are extremely correlated concepts, we can come up with a, a vector of features. So we have, we have converted our data to coordinates in n-dimensional space. Now that we have coordinates in n-dimensional space, we have to determine how far apart these points are. And you might be inclined to say, well, the standard way that we calculate the distance between two points in some coordinate space is using some variant of Pythagorean theorem. To which I would say, okay, but no. <laughs> so... Rather than using, so the problem with the problem with the Pythagorean with using Pythagorean theorem is that it's not applicable to it's not applicable to discrete systems. So it's only applicable to continuous systems, where the data that we're currently that currently exists there's no halfway between true and false. There's nothing between 0 and 1. So it would be nonsense to have something that came out that way. So instead, we're going to calculate what's called the Minkowski distance, which is also sometimes called the taxi cab distance, uh, taxi cab metric, or taxi cab distance, or the Manhattan distance. Because it's kind of, if you think of the grid that's on the screen here as being blocks in a city, a car cannot travel through the blocks of the city. So each of these, the red line, the blue line, and the yellow line, each one of these are, is the same length. So each of these is the same distance in taxicab metric. So once we, once we take the taxicab distance between these points, uh, we then normalize it for the number of 
dimensions. So, yes, we take that, we raise that to the power of p, and then we essentially take the root of p, which is fine. So, here is an example. If we were to take the taxicab distance between these two points, uh, 2, 2, and 6, 5, how far would it be? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The distance is 7. There you go. And if we were to take the Euclidean distance, it would be the square of 3, which is 9, plus the square of 4, which is 16. That makes 25. Take the square root. So that is 5. There you go. And I, I, realize, I realize I'm going through this fairly quickly, but that's because basically I've got 15 minutes to cover, you know, 50 slides. So we'll see how far we can get. A Python function to calculate Minkowski distance is described as follows. It corresponds exactly to the formula presented in the previous slide. Then we create a class for our models. It contains the name of the model and a feature vector, which is just a list in our case. And then if we want to calculate the distance between two animals, we return the Minkowski distance uh, between self and other fe self dot features and other dot features, given that there are two elements. So, if we perform all of this, entering our data into this data, data set would look as follows. You can see we have assigned variables that are all of these animals, and then we have we're just organizing all of these animals into a list. And in order to calculate the similarity between these animals, we use the following code, which I'm not going to read, it's, but the result is this table. So you can see the computer thinks that rattlesnakes and cobras are the same thing because there is no difference with respect to the feature vectors. And notice also that alligators and dart frogs are different from everything else by a factor of four. This is an interesting result. The reason that this is the case is because in our original data set, zeros and fours were not normalized. So essentially, what happens is the maximum value in, like the maximum distance in legs between two elements, uh, between two animals, is four times the maximum distance in any other category. So the result of that is that the legs category with respect to finding the difference between things is given t four times the weight that any other category is. So if you were to perform a slightly more robust, slightly less biased towards legs, statistical analysis, you what you would do is you would normalize number of legs by the maximum number in number of legs. So you would divide each of these elements by four. That would give the number of legs equal weighting with respect to determining distance. And then, you know, all of these things would be far less. You would have 1.24 instead of 4.24. But yeah. So, linear regression is also a type of machine learning. It's a type of supervised learning. I'm going to go through it a little bit quickly. Essentially, the point of finding of linear regression is to find the equation y equals c times x plus b, you're trying to find the coefficient c, and you're trying to find the, uh, the intercept b. However, we can generalize this to uh, a, where is it? Oh my goodness. This is generalizable 
to any number of uh, dimensions. So the procedure for linear regression, very quickly, first we obtain data, then we divide the data into two sets, a training set and a testing set. We do so randomly. Next, we run linear regression on the trading data to get the proposed coefficient and intercept. Next, we use those values to calculate the accuracy of the prediction. So the t we compare the linear regression model that we found to the y values that are in the testing set and measure how far apart they are so that we can come up with some sort of measurement of the accuracy of the methodology. And once again, the more data you use, the more accurate it's going to be. The, with respect to measuring the predicted y values, we would be using a mean squared error, which essentially means we are taking the difference, we are taking the square of that difference, and then we are summing the square of that difference and normalizing by the number of things, the number of samples. So that is the mean of the square of the errors. So another way that you can do this is using the R squared score, which is a goodness of fit model, which you can get Python to calculate automatically using scikit-learn which is a library for uh, all kinds of machine learning and other interesting applications. If you want to get scikit-learn, install Anaconda. Again, linear regression. So here is an example of performing linear regression. To obtain the data, we are generating the, the sample data. Notice we have to give it essentially a linear model in order to be able to generate a uh, data points that conform to a linear model, so we kind of have to know what we're looking to have as an output in order to generate the stuff to find the output, but that's sort of beside the point. Excuse me. So we have a spread on the data, we have a number of samples, and we have a coefficient. We calculate a number of y values and have a data vector that is that contains a sequence of xy tuples. Next, we divide the data into two sets, training and testing. So with respect to this, we essentially have two lists. We have a training list and a testing list, and values from the generated sample, the generated samples from the previous function those are randomly assigned to one or the other. In this particular instance, we are generating ahead of time all of the indices. Uh, basically, we're generating a list of ones and zeros, and if it's if the corresponding elements in the uh, in the sample are one or zero, we bump it one way or the other. So the reason you do it randomly is to offset any generation bias that may have existed in the data. Like if you took the first half and made that the training and the second half and made that the sample, that wouldn't be a good way to split the data because if the data, like we know that the data here was generated randomly, but if the data wasn't generated randomly, it might be that later values have some bias in them, which will throw off your results. So if we generate the data, we get something like this following graph. In order to run linear regression, import linear model from sklearn. Re regression is equal to linear model dot linear regression. X train is equal to fix 1D array. You have to put that in in order for it to work correctly. No particular, well, there's, there are reasons for it, but they're sufficiently complicated that I'm not going to get into it. Just, you know, do it. Then regression.fit X train Y train, and then you get a coefficient and an intercept calculated into the regression opt the linear model object. So,
the reason that you have to do this this way is that your the scikit-learn expects things in higher dimensions, but we are doing a very basic 2D version here. So we then we can then take our training our testing data and calculate uh, you know graph the graph it together with our calculated linear linear regression model and we can also calculate what our mean squared error and an r r2 score error are using mean squared error and r2 score which are imported from sklearn.metrics so it's all done automatically for you in a very easy and reasonable fashion and as i said as I was going to say, linear regression can occur with multiple dimensions of data. So when you perform linear regression, what you get is a one-dimensional object expressed in two-dimensional space from data that's expressed in two-dimensional space. So for each, for each form of regression in higher dimensions, you are essentially the 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 model of your data is one dimension lower than the space in which you are doing it. So if you had three dimensional data, a regression model of that three dimensional data would be a two dimensional object in three dimensional space, i.e. a plane. If you had four dimensional dimension, uh, if you had a four dimensional data set, then you would get a three-dimensional object in four-dimensional space as your regression. So that's how regression works. So with respect to classification, generally speaking with classification, the idea is to try to come up with labels to the data. So going back to our exam example uh, for animals, we want to come up with a model that predicts the classification based on the features. So we might be trying to we and in something like this you can try to predict any one of the features, right? You could try to predict number of legs or scales or reptile or egg laying or any of those things. So again, we first convert each animal's features into a feature vector with some value representing each feature. For our animals, we get the following features, exactly, you know, and we can see from that that we are trying to predict whether or not it is a reptile. So the classification procedure is, in general, number one, obtain your labeled data. Number two, construct feature vectors for the labeled data. Number three, divide the data into two data sets, a training set and a testing set. Four, train a classifier on the train da training data to develop a model. Five, use the classifier to predict the labels for the testing data. And six, measure the accuracy of the predicted label on the testing data. So, in order to measure the accuracy of predicted data on test, uh, the predicting predicted data, since we have, since we're going for a Boolean here, right? We're trying to determine we're, we're just saying yes or no, right? We can have four possible outcomes from our from comparing our modeled prediction to our actual test data. Either the prediction was positive and the test was positive, which means we get a true positive result. The prediction was negative, but the result was positive, and we get a false negative re uh, result. We get a pos a, or we get a false positive or a true negative. It's kind of like when you have a test on, uh, like a medical test, and it has a certain percent chance of actually telling you whether you have the thing it's testing for. You have the idea of getting a false positive test for you know, <laughs> coronavirus or something. It's kind of like that. So what you want is to have a high percentage ch uh, rate of 
determining either true positives or true negatives. It's not a bad thing to predict things negatively. It's a bad thing to predict predict things negatively when they are in fact positive. We are looking for accuracy to the testing values, not for positivity or negativity with respect to individual test cases. Um, and in order to do that, you can use NLTK, which is the Natural Languages Toolkit. But I see I have reached 120, and therefore the, uh, the lecture is, is done. So, yeah. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll stay on the line for a little while to answer any questions that you might have. But uh, aside from that, yeah. Thank you very much. See you on Monday. <laughs> no. No. Question, will machine learning be on the exam? Answer, no. No, that would be a little bit unfair. SQL is totally, totally fair game, though. Okay, I think that's it. If you have any more questions, please email me. But uh, yeah, there we go. See you guys on Monday.